I recently went to the Papago Park Military Museum in central Phoenix. I was in search of more of the story of the Triple Nickel, the 555th All-Black Paratrooper Regiment from World War II. They had their origins out of Fort Huachuca in Arizona. But instead, I found a different story of two men, a story of two feet, two medals, 23 and one half missions, and 2,000. 725 days in a POW camp. Hi, and welcome to Yeti at Large. This is a channel focused on making the most out of what you have, no matter where you're at. Thanks for tuning in and helping out. I was eager to learn more about the Triple Nickel as we always considered them a homegrown unit. The stories my vice principal in junior high would tell us about the all-black paratrooper regiment who in no small part helped the war effort by fighting forest fires started by Japanese high altitude hot air balloon bombs in the Pacific Northwest. He knew some of these guys and he used to joke they called him the triple nickel because that's about what these poor guys got paid. I was disappointed to learn that they didn't have an exhibit at the museum until the curator explained to me that it's an all donation museum. If you have any information, the Papago Park Military History Museum would love to set up a display there. Not finding the exhibit that I was looking for, of course I reviewed the insignias of the Gila monster. Arizona's the only state that has an indigenous monster roaming our woods and our deserts. I also looked at the displays for Ira Hayes. He helped raise the flag on Iwo Jima. But then I learned something about two people I had never heard much of before, and I'm proud to share a very small part of that with you today. So the question remains, do you live in a place that actually has monsters walking around the wilderness? The mighty Gila monster. When I saw the wall of Arizona Medal of Honor recipients, I was particularly moved by the story of Silvestri Herrera. Sylvester. He had lost both of his feet attacking two different machine gun emplacements outside of Mertzweiler, France. This was March of 1945. Guys at that point knew the war might be coming to an end. Mertzweiler is very far east in the French, almost to the German border, uh, just north of Hagenau. A month earlier, Ira Hayes had raised the flag at Iwo Jima, and these soldiers were trying to be smart and trying not to get hurt. Well, uh, PFC Herrera had stepped on a German landmine and is reported to have lost both of his feet instantly. Uh, excruciating pain and unchecked blood loss, and he still maintained the forward firing position and was able to allow the guys in his uh, uh, squad to flank those German machine gun nests. The amazing thing is he survived his injuries and was returned to the States. You can see him here uh, receiving the Medal of Honor from President Truman. They were concerned he wouldn't be strong enough to receive the medal in person. He made a point of being there in person. He also, about uh, a year later, received the Mexican National uh, Premier Merito Militar, per, forgive my pronunciation. It's the Mexican equivalent of the Medal of Honor. Uh, he was noted as being the only living person to authorize to wear both of those. You can see him here proudly displaying both of his medals. Significant American, significant Arizonan. He was very proud of his Mexican heritage and his Arizona residency. I felt very honored to learn a small part about this man and his legacy continues today. There's a lot of great material available to learn more about him. As I continued looking through the displays, I found this sky blue jumpsuit. It wasn't connected to any particular display and didn't have a lot of information, but I found it very interesting that on the chest, there was a patch for the F-105, the thud, and it said 23 and one half missions. I read the name on the jumpsuit and it was Ron Byrne. And I did a little research standing there in the museum. And I learned about this man who eventually retired as a colonel, had a long and distinguished flight career. 
Uh, I learned he had 75 missions over Korea flying the Sabres and the Super Sabres, the F-100s. Um, but what was most important and why this jumpsuit was so significant is he had qualified to fly the F-105 and returned flying combat missions over North Vietnam. Now the F-105 didn't have the best reputation as being a nimble or agile fighter plane. It was not designed for that kind of a close combat role. And our rules of engagement at the time appear to have been predictable enough that the North Vietnamese air defense systems were able to target these thuds with uh, alarming accuracy. Uh, in the middle of his 24th mission uh, on September 29th of 1965, he was shot down over North Vietnam. Now, what I found most inspiring about this man, like I do many of the stories of the POWs from the Vietnam War, he spent 2,725 days in a POW camp. He was repatriated to the United States uh, on February 12th of 1973, a few days before my fifth birthday. The resolve that people show in times of hardship in those situations is utterly astonishing to me. I was immediately reminded of Viktor Frankl's quote from the book that he wrote, Man's Search for Meaning, where he talked about the last of the human freedoms is to choose how you will react to any given situation. Viktor Frankl was interned in a Nazi concentration camp and subject to some horrible medical experiments. But yet, through it all, he remained polite and congenial to his captors. It frustrated him to no end. But, like Colonel Byrne, he came home at the end of it all. I remember seeing the footage of the POWs flying home and how happy they all were to be back in America. I suspect that Ron's buddies were so happy to have him back that they couldn't help having a little bit of gallows humor, made him a jumpsuit with 23 and a half missions. That's pretty messed up, guys. Pretty funny, though. I'll leave you with one final story from the Papago Park Military History Museum, and it might be nothing more than a tall tale relayed third hand by a vice principal to a bunch of junior high kids. It's well known there were many POW camps in Arizona during World War II, and the, probably the best well-known was the camp at Papago Park. It was a German-specific camp. And there was a well-documented escape from that camp that was chronicled in several newspaper articles and other stories. You can read about it here. But among the lesser known escape attempts involved a group of German POWs that were busy about building a boat from stolen materials as they planned on escaping on the mighty Salt River and floating downstream. As I was told, the guards were well aware of this plan and even went so far as to leave materials out where the POWs could squirrel them away for their plan. Uh, the guards were reported to allow this to go on because it kept the prisoners quiet polite and working very hard. They uh, are reported to have let the escape get so far as the POWs getting down to the Salt River to launch their boat, only to their horror to discover that the mighty Salt River is bone dry 11 months and three weeks out of the year. The guards are reported to have marshaled the POWs back to the camp trying to contain their laughter. I couldn't imagine these poor Europeans having no idea what the dry riverbeds of the Southwest were like. I want to thank the Papago Military Museum for their support of this, keeping history alive. If you find yourself in harm's way tonight, please take good care of yourself and be careful.